cocaine wasn't seen to be a problem until southern blacks were seen, seen to be using it. Cannabis wasn't seen to be a problem until it was the Mexican immigrants. It's always been about racism. I'm Neil Woods. Uh, I'm a former police officer, former undercover police officer. Quite by accident, really, I managed to get an attachment to the drug squad. One of them said to me, do you want to have a go at buying some crack? And he gave me 20 quid and he pointed me towards this blue door in Derby. And I went there and knocked on the door and I uh, walked away with my 20 pound stone of crack cocaine. And that defined the next 14 years of my life. In the early days, I quite often played a travelling thief. As an undercover police officer, you're not an actor. You're playing a different version of yourself. I would spend some weeks just building a legend, you know, being in a different place. And you literally have to be somewhere, you know. If you say you used to go to the pub somewhere, you'd need to know who works behind the bar on a Wednesday. You do have to put that kind of work in, but it, the first few years, it, it, it was a bit sketchy, really, and hope the bullshit worked. There's been so many times when I, I thought this was it. One of the dramatic ones is when I was working in Stoke and I'd been buying weights of heroin from this dealer and he was, he was one of the main dealers in that area. And uh, I was quite comfortable with this guy. He opened the door and he stuck a samurai sword to my throat. He says, you're a fucking drug squad. You're a fucking DS, I know you are. But then I heard this woman laughing and I saw this woman, she stuck her head out from behind the side of him and she says, I thought he was going to say he was then. And then they started laughing. They were just taking the mickey. I laughed about it later anyway. <laughs> person I got to know very well in, in Northampton was a young lady who went by the street name of Uma. I was decided to say that I had no money one day and just struggling and rattling, just to fit in, to say I wasn't too suspicious. And she saw me and she gave me five quid. I says, yeah, but you're going to need that. Have you got any more money? She says, no, it's me only fiver. I'll be fine for the next four hours. I've just had a hit, I'll be fine. I'll, I'll earn it back by then. And that simple generosity is absolutely startling among the sort of street community of problematic heroin users. It was incredible to me, to be honest. I think the most useful thing that I took to the work and allowed me to develop is using empathy. You could almost call it weaponizing empathy because I would go into an inner city area. I quickly found that actually the best people to get a foot up and the best people to get the connections with were the really vulnerable people. This guy called Cammy actually dealt heroin for a cartel that was causing most of, the, most of the violence. So he was the person I manipulated. Now, he was a user dealer and he was really being exploited by this gang to deal heroin. And I took advantage of him. But at the end of that operation, after six months, you know, he'd been committing offences on bail, he'd been helping me out. When he was in the police cells, when he'd been arrested, he was on minute-to-minute -minute watch, suicide watch, because he had seen me as his only friend in the world and the only person he could trust. And, and that sort of, that breaking of trust to him, it was just the last straw. I've really uh, changed people's lives around and, and not for the better. I mean, I enjoyed the work, there's no, get, there's no getting around that. I enjoyed manipulating people. Uh, I enjoyed the intellectual exercise of lying and maintaining a lie. I infiltrated a gang called the Burger Bar Boys, quite an infamous gang. And they were taking over the heroin and crack cocaine supply in Northampton. So, you know, it took six months of work. Eventually, there was 96 people arrested for that operation. I spoke to the intelligence officer who was overseeing it and monitoring all the intelligence from it. And he said, we've managed to interrupt the drug supply in Northampton for as much as two hours. In retrospect, I know that all of the policing I did with drugs, both undercover and conventional policing, was completely futile. I just made the lives of the vulnerable more unbearable. The first most important step policymakers can do is actually the easiest one and that's control heroin so problematic heroin users get given heroin those ones that need it it should be about harm reduction and a medical model takes the market away from organized crime and you will get a reduction 
in heroin use because there's no incentive to sell, there's no incentive to commit crime. Eventually, you should have a full regulated system for things like MDMA so that people know that they're buying a measured dose with advice on the label. We know there's no adulterants because it's produced in a, a professional laboratory. Those are the places to start and you know this is a long game and we've got to do it incrementally. International drug policy has always been more about who is perceived to be using a drug than the, than the perceived dangers of the drug itself. Cocaine wasn't seen to be a problem until southern blacks were seen, seen to be using it. Cannabis wasn't seen to be a problem until it was the Mexican immigrants. They even changed the name from cannabis. They changed it to marijuana to make it sound more foreign. It's always been about racism and we should wake up to that problem and we should be doing something about it. There isn't a drug-free prison in the world anywhere. Prison is the worst possible way of dealing with drugs, either by people who are using drugs problematically, sending drug dealers to prison. It makes no difference. It just causes a gap in the market and causes more violence. The answer is so obvious. We form drug policy.